Welcome everyone to the 20th edition of DemoCam Calgary. DemoCam is all about uh, demoing real software. That means there's no PowerPoint allowed. Presenting with PowerPoint, you're getting yanked off the presentation. Hi, I'm Dimitrio and I'm with iConnectivity. I've been a musician for the last 20 years, producing people, producing uh, groups, and I use pretty much synthesizers to, to record everything. If people want a band to sound like, uh, sound like a band in the background or an orchestra, anything like that, I use synthesizers. Synthesizers can talk to each other using what's called MIDI. And uh, they can talk to each other, they can talk to computers using MIDI. MIDI is a messaging system. It stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface, and it's been around for 25 years. And uh, it's, it's used by almost everything, almost every synthesizer, every controller that you find is running MIDI. And, and that's how you can make a lot of music. And music is, has gotten uh, a, a new resurgence lately with, uh, with Apple bringing about mobile devices and having MIDI capability, all of these music software that's available. And it's, it's, it's gotten a lot of interest. And the, here's a piece of software that I downloaded from the App Store. It runs on my iPad. It's called Music, uh, music Studio, $15 app. Uh, it's from a company called Zootin. We didn't write this. But it's, it's kind of cool. It's, it, it has 128 tracks. You can record your tracks. You can play up to 100 different instruments on there. And it's got an on-screen keyboard, which is kind of cool. But I'm a musician. And to be able to play this, if I took my eyes off that keyboard, I would be lost. I would be playing wrong notes like crazy. So I'd like to be able to play a keyboard like this with tactile feedback so that I can do it. And how can I do this? Well, our first product out of the gate is called iConnect MIDI. iConnect MIDI is a piece of hardware. It's right here. I don't know if you can see that. It's a little black box here. And you can plug in anything MIDI into it. And iOS devices up to two, or a Mac or a PC, up to two. And you can mix and match those as well. And this allows you to have all of those talking together. So now, instead of playing this on-screen keyboard, I can use this keyboard. And I'm actually playing that. You couldn't do that before, because this is a USB MIDI keyboard. The, the iPad has a 30-pin connector, and you just couldn't connect them. But now we can do it with iConnect MIDI. I'm going to show you something on here. This piece of software is a really great uh, thing. I'm going to record something. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to put bass on top of that. There's bass. Now that's all been recorded. I'm going to continue on and add drums. All of those are done by these little keyboards. Now, why do I have three keyboards on here? Because I could, I could do this all with one keyboard, but you could grab a bunch of people and play this together as a group, and all the sounds coming out of this iPad. Now, you could do this with up to eight keyboards, either keyboards, I've got a drum controller here is what I was doing the drums with, and you could do up to eight of them. Now, all of that's now recorded onto this little song. You can get it to play. That's just what I just played here. Now, one thing that we have IP for, uh, patent pending, is a new technology that's within our box, and it's called MIDI bridging. Here's a synthesizer here that, that uh, it's a traditional synthesizer. All of these are, they are using USB MIDI, and this traditional synthesizer uses the five-pin DIN connectors on the back. Two out of five of you are probably musicians in this room, so you'll kind of know what I'm talking about. You've probably seen those round ports on the back of your keyboard, and that's what this has but it can't communicate directly with USB MIDI devices without a computer. There were, there were interfaces for that, but you always needed a computer. What our box does is allows you to communicate between those two without a computer, and that's patent pending. That's actually brand new. So this synthesizer here, it's a, a micro chord. That's what it sounds like. There's pitch band. Now what if I wanted to play this from this keyboard? Well, I can. I'm actually playing the sounds off of there, and that's what MIDI is. It's just sending a note that says, I played a C key here, play me the C sound from, from there. And that's what that does. Now I mentioned you can plug in up to two uh, I can, uh, iOS devices on here. I've got the iPad connected to iConnect MIDI, and I've also plugged in this iPod Touch. It's running the same piece of software that I downloaded from, 
from the App Store, but I'm going to use a feature on here that, that takes advantage of the accelerometer on the iPod that's going to translate it to pitch bend data. That level of control is something that I've never seen before, and this is a, a great, the great thing about it. Now, I know this is a lot of equipment on here. We've got a lot of cables. Half of them are for the audio. But the other half are USB cables, the MIDI cables, and it's a little bit daunting. But the great thing about this is that you don't have to have all this. If you wanted to take this on the road with you, if you're a composer, if you're a student, if you are somebody that's going to write music or just play music, then you can take this with you. You can take a little USB keyboard, maybe a drum pad controller. You can bring your iPod, touch, you run this software on it, and an iConnect MIDI. This is a feature of MIDI sequencing, of MIDI music production. This is for the next generation of musicians. iConnect MIDI. Thank you. the price on the device? 179. Uh, we're in production right now um, and there's we've got 3,000 orders from distributors in the US and uh, Europe, Australia. Is there a restriction on the size of the keyboard? No, anything that's MIDI. You can use a full 88 key. I just happen to have these ones because these are portable for this gig. But uh, you can plug anything in. So whether it's the DIN MIDI ports, USB MIDI, anything. You could have you know, a 160 key keyboard if you could find one. It's any app that is Core MIDI compliant. Core MIDI was, was a, a framework that Apple had on their Apple computers for a long time, and they, they finally ported it to the 4.2 version of the iOS. And now any app that's running this will be able to be compatible with our device, which is Core MIDI, and it just runs out of the box. So you can mix and match. You can actually do an iOS, two iOS devices, two computers, or an iOS device and a computer, so of those two ports. What's your strategy on taking to market? Sort of how, what's, what's your channel that you're going to use? We have four distributors, uh, music distributors in, uh, in the States, one in Canada, the largest distributor in Europe. Uh, we, our marketing guy is down from Irvine, California. He launched several music devices in the last 20 or 30 years, so he was a coup for us. So he was good at getting us our foot in the door with the distributors. And, and it's, uh, there's a lot of enthusiastic musicians out there that want to try this new new way of making music. What's your marketing strategy to get it out to the market? How are you going to present it? Through our website, through videos, we've done the trade shows. Um, we had a, a really great response out of the NAM show, the North American Music Manufacturers show. Um, people were looking for us then because we did CES before that, and that gave some the week before, and that gave us a lot of buzz for the NAM show as well. So, uh, at our website, we've been, we've been making videos to demonstrate this, and and um, we have some uh, reviews coming out in, mag in in some of the trade magazines. A keyboard out of the NAM show um, picked us as one of the top 50. Um, uh, devices out of the NAMM show. We didn't solicit that either. They just said, it, quote, one of the coolest devices in the show. So it's, it's been generating a lot of buzz by itself. What are your biggest challenges coming up? Uh, raising capital for manufacturing. We managed to raise a little bit there, but that's always been an ongoing challenge. And that's why we're, we're actually a couple of months behind getting it to, there's a big demand from our, um, our European distributor. And uh, they're, 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 really, they're really pushing us to get it. But our first thousand batch is, is, uh, is currently being made. I guess lastly, how can the uh, community help you? App developers, now that you've seen this, I mean, it's one thing to see it in, on video, but it's another thing to see this and try this. I mean, this is a really fast responding product. You notice, I would, as a musician, the moment I hit that key is the moment I want to hear the sound, and there is no latency on this. You can try it for yourself. And once you see that, if you are a musician, and if you're an app developer, you can come up with some cool ways to do it. I mean, I just demonstrated the, the hand waving for pitch bend. And if you feel that yourself, that's a completely different story. I can see sound designers from movies actually controlling different sounds that way. And I, I noticed that uh, firsthand. So if you have that kind of inkling, then, then, then write an app that just you know, using this as a tool that just blows away anything else that's out there. Right on, boss. Yeah, Hi, I'm Don Chapman. The company is called Kent Imaging. The name is not anything to do with anybody that I know other than when I was flipping through the channels on TV one day, a mailbox showed up that said Kent on the side of it. So I was passing through Smallville, obviously. And I said to myself, I wonder if I could get that name on the internet. And 
I couldn't get Kent, but I could get KentImaging.com. So that's the name of the company. We are taking imaging. What, what this imaging does is it's spectroscopy, if anybody knows what that is. Our eyes see three colors, red, green, blue. In spectroscopy, we look at multiple wavelengths of light, assemble pictures, and then do algorithms on those pictures to come up with a resultant image based on the particular uh, reflective light that comes off at the different frequencies. The theory behind spectroscopy is every single material has its own unique characteristic of light reflection, just like a fingerprint. So some might reflect more in the red, some are more in the green, some are more in the blue. We figured out with the National Research Council of Canada in Winnipeg, their Institute for Biodiagnostics, the reflective signature of oxygenated hemoglobin. And what this imaging system does is it looks down through your skin and we can tell how much oxygen and blood is traveling underneath the surface of your skin. And I'll tell you a little bit more, I'll take a quick picture and then I'll tell you about the uh, applications of it. If we can see if this comes up. Did you switch this over to? Okay. Yeah, just a sec, it's my computer. I'm going to uh, take a picture of my finger. A few seconds ago, I put an elastic on my finger to cut off the blood circulation. So what this will do is it takes a picture. Okay, my finger's only turning a little bit black. <laughs> that, that's the color, I gotta take it off my finger yeah, now. <laughs> it's, it's not actually black to look at in the human eye, but the, the calculation and the algorithms that run on the particular four images we take, uh, one of them's at visible red light, because you'll see a red light flash every once in a while. The rest of them are the near infrared region. And so when it does the algorithm on it, it detects that there's a lot less oxygen and blood in that particular end of my finger than the rest of the finger. The applications of this are quite varied and there's a lot of them. Um, in a burn case, for instance, it's often hard to determine a second degree burn from a third degree burn because depending on how fast and how intense the burn was, the outside could look crispy but the inside might not be done. Kind of like if you cook a steak fast on the outside, it gets burnt but it, the inside's still rare. So it's extremely important for the doctors who right now use purely visible indications from their eyes of what the burn is like, that they can take a picture and tell just how deep the burn went. If it killed the blood circulation in the lower dermis, it's killed. You have to do a skin graft. If it isn't, just salve in a bandage and send the guy home. That's about a half a billion dollar mistake a year in the US in just burns. Then you go to things like uh, Heart surgery. When they open up a patient to do heart work on their heart, they are guessing at how much blood perfusion there is through the heart. But you can take a picture with this type of thing, and they've been doing it with one of the cameras over in Italy, in Pisa, Italy, and studying pigs' hearts. And they can clamp an artery, and they can see exactly how much of the heart is not being oxygenated now. We're starting next month a breast reconstruction study in Winnipeg. Today, instead of just lopping a breast off with, with cancer, they open it up, take the cancer out, do a tummy tuck at the same time and use that tissue to rebuild the structure of the breast. The problem they have is when they finish, they can't really tell if all of the breast is getting good circulation of blood. The camera is going to be used to try and identify that because everything right now is visual. Then you get into applications like foot ulcers for diabetics, whether the blood flow is good, bad. If I give you a drug, does it get better? Eyes. Common cause of blindness is retinopathy in diabetics, which is a starvation, a hypoxia of the retina. You can take a picture and see. Bed sores, it's a depletion of blood and oxygen to parts of the tissue on a person's back that's lying in bed all the time. And you can again take pictures and try and head that off before it happens. So that's what this is all about. Um, I have, oh yeah, I had a picture here. So what this is important to the doctors is they are right now making judgment calls. As we move forward in technology, the problem you typically have with the medical community is in the past, uh, it was the 30 year experienced doctor that could look at something and judge what was wrong or right with you. Today, young doctors and, and the community as it grows is looking for technology to replace that. So that's why you always hear, well, I'm not sure what's wrong, let's get an MRI, a CT or something. They're trying to use technology to help better their understanding of what's wrong with you. This is one of the tools, kind of like a thermometer in that sense, 
where this doesn't tell you cut along the dotted line, but it gives you an indication of what you're dealing with and then you can treat it. Plus you can use this kind of technology all through the healing process when they're doing bandage changes and that to examine the wound to make sure that it is healing. And you don't have to touch the person, it's just we're putting, there's a whole mess of LEDs under there at the specific frequencies that we need to look at. So you could take a million pictures, it couldn't hurt anybody. My screen. No, uh, spectroscopy is taught in university, I believe. Um, this particular is, is new to us. Uh, we have the patent rights to it worldwide. Uh, we have um, several patents actually on it, and we obtained them from the National Research Council as they patented it. I simply did a worldwide exclusive license for the patents into our company. So we have it now, effectively. The only people that we've had trouble with, you'd be okay. <laughs> but but we have we have you know the and I'm not exactly sure what countries they're from but some of the countries where you see a person that just seems to be so black they absorb all light there is absolutely zero reflectance of light when we shine stuff on them so they can't get a picture of them the interesting part is is once the top layer of skin is burnt we get a very good picture of what's going on after that and most people when you see burns they're they're not a pleasant thing but uh, even a very black skinned person under the first layer, it all turns pinkish. So, because you mentioned it's not just birds, you did mention that they use it. Yeah, I, I, can't, I can't use it on a very black. East Indian, dark East Indian works, but the real black skinned people from Africa and the Caribbean, there's just no light coming off them. They're just not going to make it. Once you guys get FDA approval, what, uh, what's your next step from there in getting it into usage? We've already had uh, some major presentations and papers written on the technology, so that helps you to try and get some of the key doctors involved. And we right now have several of what I call world-leading type doctors on my, advi my advisory board. And so, f for instance, in Burns, the breast reconstruction and that, these guys are world-renowned and they will help us by the fact that they like it and adopted it to get it into the rest of the world. Um, I will build an entire sales force and go after it all myself. That's what I do. So have you overcome all the technical challenges apart from the reflectivity of some uh, dark-skinned people? Pretty much. Um, the original camera system that they used and developed, which we kind of look at as the, the uh, gold standard, it takes 42 seconds to take a picture. The problem with long-term taking a long time to take pictures was that people move and then that destroys the image because you've got to take the same pixel from each image and do the math on it. So we have another generation of this which we're going to start working on soon, which is um, a handheld unit that works extremely fast and we're using beam splitters to break up the pictures so that we don't have to do... Right now, that has a rotary filter in it. So there's actually a little rotary filter running around in there. It's two inches in diameter and has four frequencies on it. You're a member of a couple of uh, different angel groups. Yep. So that being Venture Alberta and Alberta Deal Generator. So if anyone's looking for money or looking for entry into the angel world, Don is certainly one of the guys to talk to. I can help you out with that too. Uh, but he also helps with some of the Alberta grant money. So uh, he can lead you in the right direction, who to talk to, what websites to read up on if you're looking for some grants to kind of fire up uh, your next company. If you're looking for money, I'll tell you right up, look at the IRAP program. You do your own shred stuff, it's not hard to do. You don't need to pay 30% or 40% to somebody to do your shred programs for the taxes. I've done all mine for 25 years, never had somebody do it, we get money every year. There are two main programs to look at in Alberta to get some money. One is, one is the voucher programs, which are a $15,000 voucher or a $50,000 voucher. It's a gift. There, it's got some matching, but I think it's a 25% matching to it. And then there's the associates program, which is R&D and commercialization, which will pay the, a bigger piece of the guy's salary for, I, I think we lowered it to a year. It used to be two years, but now you can get an R&D associate, so someone to help and work in your company for R&D or commercialization. So there are programs to help you get money. You don't have to sell your soul to do it. 
Um, and a lot of it is, is matching stuff though, so if you have you know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars from somewhere, you can probably make it go a lot further. All right, what I have for Don Chapman. AVAC is a private company in Alberta investing in Alberta companies. We've got about $126 million that we manage. Um, most of that is direct investing in companies, generally a little bit later stage than where, where some of these companies are. Two of the presenting companies here, Don with Kent and Tim with Usiful, they're both um, AVAC portfolio companies. Typical investment for us is in the range of $800,000 to a million, sometimes a little bit more than that. It's all based on progress in the business. Um, return for us is, it's, so it's not equity, which is, which is always nice for, uh, for the other investors. So we're not taking an ownership stake in the company. It is done as a royalty repayment to twice the amount that we disperse. So you know, if you look at it from a cost of capital, it's actually very favorable to the, to the entrepreneurs. So as one of the companies that AVAC has invested in, and, and more than their upper limit, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what it's like being on the other side. It's great money. It is matching money, so you don't just get to uh, run off and have a good time with it. Um, when you're in their portfolio, you're also under their scrutiny and their direction to try and help you become a better businessman, for instance. Uh, they will make you do your reporting, make you do your accounting stuff according to the rules. The money comes, it comes in tranches. It's based on your performance. It's not just a lump of money at the front. You have to perform all the way through the schedule that's laid out and you agreed to at the beginning, it can change and flex because all businesses do that as time goes on. But it's better than actually, uh, we found in Venture Alberta and Deal Generator, in the past we were always just raising money and maybe we'd write a check for $800,000 and give it to somebody. And that was often turned into a mistake because once they had all the money, they just kind of ran off on their own and did what they wanted to do. And this uh, scheme of actually making it connect to milestones uh, kind of makes it's good for the company and it's also good for these guys and then your payback is typically about 2% of sales so it's not extremely onerous on you either to repay their money but it is a loan it's not free it's not a grant so it it can work very well for a lot of companies so that's from the other side <coughs> all right thank you Don and Martin uh, okay, so Gord. Gord's been around these parts for a long, long time. He's got a he's got a cool app that he's going to show us. Take her away, Gord. This is why I ran to the bar. Awesome. All right. Okay, let me know if I'm too quiet or anything. Baby UI. Uh, I had a kid just over a year ago named Graham. Somewhere around the six month mark, I was trying to, you know, play around with the iPhone with him, and uh, I didn't find anything very suitable for really, really young infant, right? I mean, there's lots of apps out there for kids and a lot of really great educational material, but there's nothing to just play around with a phone if you don't understand the basics of how iOS interfaces work. This is about as simple as an app can possibly get. Uh, I guess you guys aren't going to pick up on the audio, but as you drag your finger around, there's little uh, bubbly kind of sounds, uh, Graham sampled or me sampled. There's some innovation here in the way that there's no menus, right? If you want to change the way it's working, you rotate the device and that brings up a different particle system. And then if you go face down, it's gonna start making. And there's a speaker somewhere. So you leave it face down, it's gonna cycle through a bunch of other particle systems. So basically, um, this is kind of trial and error on my part as uh, I've got the, the app with Graham uh, at the time on an iPhone and just determining what could bring his attention back to the app as he puts it down. If it's face down, if it's making sounds every once in a while, he'll, uh, he'll usually investigate. Exit that. I'm going to show you the configuration options. Oh, I had this iPad configured for my parents, so the setting is, settings are way over here. <clears throat> Three different angles you can have it at, and the startup particle system. So this is a configuration, right? It's nowhere part of the application. You go into here. If you want to change the configuration, you'll see that there's a, quite a few particle systems to choose from. Hopefully there's good value for 99 cents, which is what it costs. I want to just talk about marketing for a second because I consider myself a video guy so I was going to have so much fun making videos for this thing. So this is what the, the normal commercial looks like. Hi there, I'm Gord, developer of Baby UI. I was looking for an app suitable for my son. The problem was that most of the apps had little pop-up menus designed for older children. I didn't really see anything suitable for babies. So I designed Baby UI. It'll respond to shake, it'll respond to touch. One of the problems I found with most apps aimed at children, they expect you to use a menu choice in order to bring up more options in the app. 
So with Baby UI, you rotate the device to bring up additional particle systems. He might not deliberately rotate the device to bring up a new option, but he will stumble upon it. As it's face down, it's making sounds about once a second. Here's it making sounds. He picks it up to investigate. I'm interacting with the iPod again. And I've got a version for iPad as a native app. Pay for one copy of Baby UI. You can load that one copy onto all your devices. There's more particle systems than just one for every 90 degree rotation. If you go into settings, you'll see there's four options. It's for every orientation, you can select your favorite particle system from a larger list here. There's no about this program screens other than the necessary loading screen. There's no information buttons at the bottom. There's no advertising on this app either. It's just strictly baby user interface, nothing more. I'll get that back to you in just a sec. My boy right now at nine and a half months, I can imagine more complex particle systems he might enjoy as he gets older. Those will be included in free updates. I'm not going to charge for additional particle systems. I'm planning on building particle systems for Baby UI until my son's old enough that he has other iPhone apps that catch his interest. Bye bye to the nice people. They're more likely to buy the app if you act cute. Give them a wave. Use a menu choice in order to bring up more options in the app. So with Baby UI, rotate the device. Work it out of the way. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So anyway, um, that's that's me making a straight up ad, right? It's actually quite boring, although it's pretty much the way I talk about the app to you guys here. It's got 3,000 views. So then I tried an anti-marketing campaign. Shall you play Mozart for your infant? Beethoven? Da 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 da. Your baby has Beethoven symphony in here. Where is baby symphony? Beethoven never listened to Beethoven vent baby. Cube of wood, what your child needs. Okay, so unfortunately Cube of Wood has got 12,000 views, but it's not an app I'm selling. It's just, uh, there's, a, there's an ad on there on the website, disparages baby UI as something that'll ruin your child forever. I was hoping to get some, uh, some sales as people were at least introduced to the concept of baby UI. So that hasn't worked, but it was a fun exercise. I'm still hoping to add some more particle systems to baby UI, make it so that it'll work for slightly older kids. There isn't really a lot more complexity I'm planning of ad on adding to it. I think my problem right now is uh, marketing because there must be some other dads out there, dads and moms out there like me, they're like, why isn't there nothing for six month olds on the iPhone? Ah. So I'm open to any suggestions on that or app suggestions. Waterproof covers. When are you launching Cube of Wood? Yeah, uh, I, I don't think I'm going to make any more uh, Cube of Wood stuff just because it doesn't, I don't know how to tie it back to Baby UI any better than uh, mentioning it on the website and mentioning it in the other video. There's like a five minute long video of Cube of Wood. That took a long time. <laughs> I would also, if you guys have kids, uh, maybe you want to buy it. How much is it? It's 99 cents. It can't get awesome. any cheaper than that except for free, but let's not go there. How many downloads do you have so far? It's about one a day. Uh, yesterday was zero, so that's going to be a really great baseline uh, if anyone buys it tomorrow. <laughs> um, so yeah, really, it's been one a day. I've tried promoting it on Reddit with free install codes. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff I just haven't thought of in terms of promo promoting it, you know? I can't, at 99 cents, the problem is the keywords I'm looking at are very close to 99 cents in AdWords and stuff like that. How much are you interested in the UI concept and the you know, delivering of babies and how much are you having fun with particle systems if you want to have some other application for that part of the technology? What, what's, do you have a, a goal that's beyond the six-month-old? I don't think I actually want to make anything that's uh, for beyond two years. I think that something like this, a two-year-old would look at it and you'd probably lose interest quicker than a six-month-old, right? Um, and I'd like to add more systems, uh, some slightly more complex, so I can totally go from six months to two years. Beyond that, there's so many good educational apps, I've got no interest in going beyond two years. Have you thought about cross-marketing for pets? I have thought about marketing to stoners and pet owners, and, uh, <laughs> and I just really need time to, to do stuff like that. I'm going to Vancouver, so hopefully I can get something like that shot out there. Uh, there's a website, a company out of Vancouver called Urban Mommy that has a lot of viewers because it's sort of milfy. Um, but uh, they're always looking for content. It seems like they wouldn't mind this. Okay, I'll check that out. Yeah, actually there's a lot of female stuff that, uh, like other people have to tell me anything involving like motherhood and children and all that, you know? I, I don't see that stuff. All right, should I hand this off to someone? Right on Gord. Hello everyone, my name is Red Shrammy. I'm with a company called Edistorm. I uh, drove down from Edmonton. Uh, for those of you who might have seen me here before, 
usually when we drive down, there's a few of us driving down and we build something and we're a bunch of jackasses because we build it on the drive down and then come demo it. Unfortunately, this time I'm down in business for uh, other reasons and I was coming solo, so coding and driving didn't match. So rather than do that, uh, we decided to uh, demo Edistorm for you here today. Um, this is actually really what I do. All the stuff I do when I'm driving down having fun is just to poke fun at Calgary and you know, just be an Edmonton guy. So this is Edistorm. Edistorm is an online sticky note brainstorming tool. We've all used stickies. We all love stickies. Stickies are a, you know, a real part of our innovation process. So what we've done is we've taken and put them online. Here you can see a big sticky wall. And uh, as we move around, um, these are a bunch of slogans and ideas. The, the beautiful thing with this application is this is just in a normal web browser. There's no flash. There's no, uh, no anything. It's straight HTML. But it's also accessible via your iPhone, iPad, or other iOS devices. And uh, it's real time and multi-location. This is being used in, in two primary markets right now. We have users in 101 countries around the world uh, that have found us. Every single one of our users almost exclusively is viral or social. Uh, we have probably 300 visitors from Google that came not from the word Edistorm. So that's either a tribute to the fact that we're spreading virally massively or uh, to the fact that we haven't done much search engine optimization. Uh, we can guess at both of them. So basically what Edistorm allows you to do is, is get groups of people either in the same room or different rooms uh, to brainstorm. This is our, uh, our brainstorm where we were working on some slogans for Edistorm. I want to try one out for you. This is sort of... Uh, one that uh, that we came up with. This is the resolution is not very good, but Edistorm everywhere your ideas want to be. So it'll uh, it'll take off of the visa angle. Basically, what happens is you can drop your sticky notes in here just by adding an idea. So these are different words that we came up with that we were working on for slogans. So we can add another word, easy to use. And as we add that, it now appears right on the interface, and any other computer connected to this brainstorm anywhere in the world or on their iPhone or iPad would see that idea instantly. How this is being used is, uh, on the corporate side, uh, an example is uh, the Environmental Protection Association of the US government did 50 brainstorms all across North America with 30 people in each brainstorm with all their different partner companies. So we had companies like Lockheed Martin, Goodyear, uh, Johnson Controls, some big monster companies signing up and using Edistorm. And the beautiful part for the EPA was, instead of flying these 150 people into the EPA offices, putting them up in hotels, feeding them dinner, all that stuff, they could just sit in their offices remotely and brainstorm in a, in a fashion very similar to how they're used to. So that was a, that was a huge success for them and they, uh, they really enjoyed it. Uh, the beauty in this app is its simplicity. It's really just sticky notes on a wall. You've got multiple colors. You also have democracy voting, so you can vote on your favorite ones just by simply clicking on it or by dragging a dot onto the idea that you like the most. And then uh, very easily we can then filter by the top ideas and instantly it sorts the ideas by the number of top votes. So this allows for very quick uh, collaboration, quick uh, polling of, uh, of your group. We also have a legend down the left hand side that lets you define what each of the colors mean to you. Everyone's got their own methodology, so we keep it really loose and open. Uh, the sharing, there's two types of storms, public and private. Uh, private ones, of course, only you can see public is uh, wide open. That's also where the pay line is. Public are free, private are, uh, are uh, via subscription. Reporting, this is the beautiful thing. Normally with a normal brainstorming session, uh, I know I've seen this happen a million times, what do we do? We take our camera, take a picture of that whiteboard and email it around to everyone and say, that was our awesome brainstorming session. The problem is all that data is locked up in a JPEG and there's, there's no way to get at that data. With Edistorm, everything's digital all the time. So with one click, we can dump it straight to an Excel spreadsheet, out to a PDF report, or out to an HTML, HTML summary. This gives you an idea of who's contributed, how many ideas, how many votes they had, full report on it, all the comments and discussion and that happens absolutely instantly. This is something you can't do with a traditional brainstorming session, and this is the kind of thing that just blows companies away. Next, I wanna show you really quickly something that we've got in development. This is called Edistorm Templates. What this does is this takes the basic process of brainstorming. Instead of starting with a white wall, you start with a template. This is a template called how to create a functional specification that we've built. We're using this internally in our labs right now, hoping to launch this very soon. 
This gives you some focus on what you're brainstorming on. So the first thing is, is what's the name of the project? So you drop that on a sticky. Then, what's the purpose of the project? Drop some stickies down. What's the target audience? What are the key features for this, uh, for this feature? What are the things that won't do? What are the screen mock-ups? Uh, so in addition to stickies, we also do photos that look like Polaroids, following the metaphors, and videos that look like little uh, film strips. So this is an example of uh, an image. You can just simply upload an image, so that's right in there. That gives you an idea of what that feature is going to look like when we launch it. This is things that are going to go in the notification panel. This is things that won't go in the notification panel, but will go in the log. So what this is, this is a great way to capture a set of information following a certain template or business process. We've got templates for Kaizen, for Six Sigma, uh, different business processes uh, that our customers are asking for. And uh, we're definitely looking at doing custom templates specifically for clients. And of course what's coming is intelligent reporting that does the same awesome report you saw there, but broken down and grouped by the different sections in the template. So there's literally thousands of templates we can get to and, and make them really tailored, customer specific, logos and all that great stuff. So I think that's probably my five minutes and that's probably the quick view of uh, what Edisturm is all about. Any questions? Uh, it's sold by subscription. We're uh, actually adjusting our business model a little bit, probably having the prices go up. Um, so if you want to get in now, it'll be the cheapest you'll ever get it, and that's a true statement. Subscriptions right now start at five dollars a month, and only the person creating the storm pays. So everyone else that wants to invite, if you want to invite thirty people into the storm, they're free to come in and participate. You only pay when you when you're doing the creation. On the education side, we've got an education offering that we're doing forty nine dollars for a whole year for two classrooms for a teacher, or $99 gets you 12 classrooms. And we're gonna be launching that at the ISTE conference in Philadelphia at the end of the month. How many users have we got? So, again, with no marketing, we've got- The $5 guys. So we've got, we've got 12,000 registered, registered users, and a small portion of them have converted. So, not, not a big enough number to make, uh, make exciting yet. But um, with, with no marketing, we've got 12,000 users, and we're going to uh, better monetize those and light up a little bit of marketing, we'll be able to add probably one or two zeros to the number of users. It's absolutely viral. We get users every day without doing anything. We haven't had one day where we haven't had a handful of users. Are you tied to the, the metaphor of the sticky note and the, the drag and drop block sort of approach or is there, you know, underlying this is, you know, there's a database structure of some sort yeah. which is could be interacted with in a completely different fashion. Do you consider different metaphors, or are you really stuck on the uh, sticky note? We're stuck on the sticky note simply because users absolutely love it. Lo people love the sticky notes. Like we get people when they see at a storm and the sticky notes, they're like, "I can't believe this! This is what I've been looking for forever!" Like people just freak out. So I really don't want to mess with that. Uh, you know, clearly uh, via APIs or or that type of thing in the future, we could certainly look at other opportunities. If you have some ideas, we're open to them. How many use simultaneous users can be in a group? Um, no limit. No, no material limit. What technology are you guys using? Yeah. So this is all HTML. There's no Flash. It's all clean HTML, jQuery all the way across the board. Yeah. Uh, for the uh, for the communications platform, initially we used something called Ape, uh, which was a, an internal one again written in PHP. Uh, since we've actually gone with a, a web service to do it, and it's actually really cool. It's called Beacon Push, and they let you have I don't know, hundred thousand real time pushes. It's just killer. It makes it makes our it allowed us to uh, not have to worry about that, that part of the scaling because they've got massive servers. So it was, good. It, was a, it was a nice move. What do you view as your barriers of entry to this from other people? You know, obviously first to market. Uh, there's no one else doing sticky notes quite the same way. There are some smaller uh, niche products that are playing in the space. One of our barriers to entry is what we won't do. So everyone asks us to do lines and they want to turn us into a mind mapping software and I refuse to. So many people that might come compete in this space might fall for that trick and become another mind mapping software. One of our barriers to entry is we're totally customer driven and, and we're, we know when to also ignore the customer. So, Can they do it without paying the five bucks or is it you have to pay the five bucks to start? How do you make... Only the creator of the storm pays. You can invite a hundred people to participate in that. If you paid the five dollars, they're all free. And no limit on the users in a public storm? Not today. These are some of the things we're going to work on with the business model. Uh, there, there's a lot of money that we're, uh, that we're leaving on the table by only charging a $5 subscription and, and having this openness. So we're just looking at altering that business model right now to capture more of the, the value. We've got 
Fortune 500 companies. We've got SAP, we've got GlaxoSmithKline, we've got GE, we've got SAP, we've got Intuit, we've got all these massive Fortune 1000 companies and they're paying $5. It's like, it's very, it's very annoying, so we're gonna fix that. <laughs> and what's the back end? Uh, the back end's all MySQL and uh, PHP. Do you, do you have a marketing guy in your company? You looking for a job? <laughs> well, or are you looking for some? Looking for an opportunity? Well, here's here's one of those opportunities that exists within Alberta in the associates program under the AIT. In the associates program under the AITF, they will allow you to hire a commercialization person. Now, the uniqueness about the commercialization person that they want you to hire is they have to be a very experienced person that can bring the company to another level, and they'll fund sixty-seven thousand a year for that person to come in. And it just seems from from your description, like you just said, you know, some of those big corporations can definitely afford more than five dollars to put Absolutely. one of these things together. Absolutely. So somebody needs to be sort of getting on that ball. That's what we're working on right now. Okay. But absolutely not. I'll talk to you a little more about that. I don't need a job. How's the trip from Kanban? From which? Kanban. Kanban. It's the same concept. Really? Yeah, it's open source. I'll have a look and I'll, I'll answer that question after with you. Okay, shall we wrap everything up here? But big round of applause. Uh, I'm Yuval Kordov. This is Ben Sargent. We're with uh, minigroup.com. Uh, ben is the UI lead and I'm the dev lead. So don't ask us too many marketing questions because we're just tech guys. Minigroup.com, as you can see, is instant private groups for worker funds, group-based uh, communication and collaboration for the workplace, uh, client relationships, family, sports teams, uh, really anywhere in your life where you want uh, private communication and collaboration. So we're going to go ahead and log in as our demo user here. This is uh, Lisa Blanco, an interior decorator. She uses Minigroup to communicate with uh, clients uh, as well as with uh, her family. Uh, her friends, uh, her volleyball team, uh, and to share interesting things that she finds on the internet, uh, such as cute pictures with a select group of people. So what we're trying to show here is that it, it really is for all aspects of your life, any kind of group that you would need to collaborate with or share with, uh, with a purpose. What we're showing here is basically Lisa's feed. Everything that's going on uh, in her groups, uh, in a, uh, basically ordered by activity. Each of these items is what we're calling a post, and so we're, we're borrowing a lot of terms from blogging and uh, other collaboration systems um, to give people sort of a sense of familiarity. And each post is very media aware. So depending on what you put in that post, you may enable certain features of the post. So for example, here, uh, simply by creating a link to a Google map, uh, we get a live uh, integrated Google Maps. So you can scroll around from there. If you include a bunch of pictures, you'll get a slideshow. So this is an example from Lisa's client group where she's working with somebody as an interior designer. So she would post a bunch of pictures and then she could uh, solicit comments on those. Uh, as well, if, if you post uh, MP3s, uh, you'll get a playlist that'll play in order. If you have a link to like a YouTube video or a Vimeo video, then that'll get embedded in line as well. So this is her uh, one cute thing a day group. This is just an example of how you could use this for workplace, but also for personal interest groups. And it's really just a central place where you can share everything privately, not worrying about bleed over between uh, people in your various groups, seeing posts from your other groups and so on. And now I can see that uh, Mitch has set up uh, an event for us. We're gonna go see uh, David Letterman next week, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, attend that. Uh, made a post here saying I really wanna do some shopping, got any ideas, so I'll say, Check this out. And maybe I attach an image of um, a map I picked up off of Super Future with some shopping recommendations. There's no restriction on file type, so you can share images, spreadsheets, really anything you want on Minigroup. And just like uh, images and posts, you can see larger versions, slideshows, etc. So that's pretty much it for this group. And now um, when I return to my feed. So basically what'll happen now is um, since Lisa's commented on this post, uh, a notification will be sent to her husband, Mitch. So he'll get that via email. And then he can either go on his iPhone or sort of any other WebKit powered mobile phone and access the site. And he can respond to her comment or he can create new content 
uh, or he can you know, go to a computer and just respond here as well. And so now that Lisa has joined uh, this group, uh, again, it shows up in her feed, and also again, it's uh, completely private. Even though she's in other groups with other members, there's uh, no kind of so-and-so commented on a friend of a friend's um, post, that sort of business. Uh, everything is very distinct. Future features, we're gonna be offering a uh, couple of premium offerings in the near future, uh, targeted more towards um, uh, really structured uh, businesses be they sports teams, clubs, uh, actual small businesses, church groups, really anything that uh, can benefit from private sharing and collaboration. So that's about it. Planning on charging for Yeah, so we're gonna have, um, uh, like as I mentioned, we're gonna have some pro options. And so that's gonna include um, anything from increased storage to kind of uh, super user organizational elements, rich stats, things like that. So it's definitely, we're, we're definitely building the business so that it can appeal uh, to everyone in every aspect of their life, but also looking for customers, not just users. So we have a, a strong uh, commerce model uh, planned. What about Facebook? What about Facebook? It sucks. Why would someone use this instead of Facebook? I'm so, sure you guys have thought of it. Do you want to Sure. Um, basically, our, our approach is not why would somebody use it instead of Facebook, um, but why would somebody use it in addition to Facebook. Uh, Facebook definitely has its place. Uh, it, you know, it's a great way to keep track of, of loose connections, um, and it's a great way to, to spend time passively. Uh, the market that we're going after is um, people who are engaged with each other for a reason, um, who value keeping the content of the conversations private, whether that's because they're discussing business or legal things or just things they don't want other people to right. see. And so Facebook has a group's functionality that does that pretty nicely sure. now, and it's fairly new, so yeah. I'm sure there was an intersection or, or an overlap. With yeah, I mean, we, we definitely looked at it. Um, we think ours is better. Um, the big thing is that by default, things on Facebook are not private, and things on Minigroup are private. And our functionality, the things that you can share, uh, the design of the site, the usability. Um, it's, it's a lot more business friendly, I think. Uh, I mean, Facebook is banned in a lot of workplaces, I think, for legitimate reasons. So we're, we're definitely, I mean, we're in the same space. There's, there's no doubt about it, but um, I think we have a good angle on it. Like being software as a service, there's a ton of guys out there doing similar things as us, and there always will be. And, and really, it's just a, you know, when we started building Mini Group, uh, we were actually using Basecamp at the time, and then it all occurred to us at the same time that we hated Basecamp. Um, we love 37 Signals, but the app itself was just proving to be um, too cumbersome for our needs, and it led us down this path of, you know, how do you build the most um, elegant, minimal, uh, kind of multi-purpose tool that you can? And uh, so it, it's, it's a lot about philosophy and a lot about privacy. Does it function as a simple mail list as well? How do you mean? If you just want to interact with it, if one of the members of the group wants to interact with it as if it were just a mailing list, can they mail the group and everyone in the group gets notified? Not yet, but it is coming. So right now, the, uh, the only mail-outs we have are, are our notification system. So you're always, well, you can choose your, your notification preferences. And um, we're looking at doing things like replying and posting via, via email. Because we have had requests for it from a lot of our, our business-oriented people. So I've noticed over time that most of the successful social networks that I'm sort of fascinated on why they're successful, and lots of them are either dedicated towards getting a job or getting a date. Which way do you see this one? <laughs> 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 why not both? Why not both? And, and that's really, it, it's really um, a huge part of our philosophy and um, a huge part of our drive. Because you look at, I mean, there's tools like Basecamp, there's Boxnet, um, there's Yammer, there's you know, Ning, there's a lot of these kind of um, uh, sites out there that really push you in one direction or the other. So it's, it's exactly about your, your current employer or it's purely about social networking or whatever. And we really like this as, you know, a central place where you can do all of that and there's just, there's no bleed over, there's no crossover. So do both. And if you can do it in the same, uh, if you can date in your workplace, then that's okay too. If I can just jump. Um. We don't like to use the term social network because we're kind of not, like we're 
we definitely take uh, some certain key elements from social networks, but we're not about growing your friends list. We're simply about being in meaningful groups with other people and the relationships that happen through those groups. So we actually used to have a feature where you would connect with people through sort of a bi-directional, you know, will you be my friend, okay, I'll be your friend kind of thing. And we got rid of it because it wasn't really a part of what we were trying to do. What technology stack are you guys using and why? And then as well as how long have you guys been working on it? The back end is all Ruby on Rails and uh, the front end is jQuery plus a lot of custom, custom stuff. Uh, it's all running on uh, Amazon Cloud Services. As far as the whys, I have a lot of pain of deployment experience through past uh, uh, jobs and we really looked at kind of a, a development stack and a deployment stack and uh, Rails is a beautiful thing and it's come a long way in the last few years and also the services oriented towards Rails have so uh, we're actually using Engine Yard which is a Rails stack built on top of EC2 and uh, it's proven to be a, uh, a joy which is hard to say about deployment. How long have you guys been here? Uh, we've been working on it uh, roughly, since the, since the creation of the business stages for a year, we've been in public beta for a couple months. You, you emphasized uh, privacy, uh, you know, creating private groups. So what do you do to differentiate yourself in terms of privacy and security features within the application or the way that you developed it? Part of it is, again, just the, the design of the site in that, so if you see here, Lisa is part of um, seven groups, and there may be people uh, she may be in these groups with some of the same people, but there's never bleed over. So as somebody in her one cute thing a day group, I can't just go to Lisa's page ever and see posts that she's made to her other groups. If I go to Lizette, who I think is supposed to be Lisa's mom, our uh, marketing guy has made up this user, um, I can go to her profiles page and it'll actually show us um, the groups that we have in common. That's why I see posts in your groups, not just Lizette's wall. And as far as just basic technology, every page on the site is SSL, uh, as far as security goes. And there's really, it's, it's, it's private by default and design. So there's, there's no kind of, is this public, is this private, or is this going somewhere I don't want it to go, that'll never happen. Do you know what your user growth is like? What kind of challenges are you facing there? Being purely private, it's, um, you don't get the same kind of viral growth you would if you were completely public. Um, and also being, uh, more focused on meaningful uh, communication and businesses and so on rather than kind of a, a platform for you know just entertainment and distraction but um, we've been using uh, some social media so uh, connecting through um, Twitter and other sources where we um, have relationships with people from past enterprises and um, we're probably also going to be doing some direct marketing in terms of um, specific verticals be it uh, small businesses sports teams, what have you. We're really finding like the creative community has, uh, has really attached onto it. Like it's, it's a really good way for, for sharing your work that's being done on spec and getting comments and, and kind of getting critiques and, and uh, which is good because that's really the market we've been, we sort of feel that we're a part of and, and have a heritage in. So um, we're starting there. I mean, each group grows as you invite new people. Um, like one of the other presenters said, you know, we add new users every single day, quite a few new users. Um, obviously we want to see that grow as much as we can so we can monetize it. Hold on. Thank you. That brings Demo Camp to a close. I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Feel free to stick around and, uh, and continue the conversation. Thanks for coming out everyone.